It's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to Dr. Lika Lafontaine, who will be the lecturer for the Clara and Frank Gertler uh, Lecture in Medicine. Alika was born and raised in Treaty 4 territory, which is southern Saskatchewan, and he has Métis, Pacific Islander, Anishinaabe, and Cree ancestry. Dr. Lafontaine has served in medical leadership positions for almost two decades, um, and more recently at the Alberta Medical Association, he served as the Representative Forum uh, Nominations Committee and Indigenous Health Committees, and is a past AMA board member. Dr. Lafontaine, however, is, uh, I could probably take the entire time for his presentation to tell you what he's achieved in his young life. He was the youngest recipient of the prestigious undergraduate um, NSERC research grant through the University of Regina. Uh, after completing his science in, uh, in chemistry and completing his MD, he, uh, he became CBC's Canada um, next great prime minister, winning that competition. And he also uh, has been named as the first Indigenous doctor listed in the medical posts, 50 most powerful uh, physicians. More recently, Dr. Lafontaine has co-led the Indigenous Health Alliance Project, one of the most ambitious health transformational initiatives in the Canadian history. And in 2020, he co-founded Safe Spate Net Net Networks with his brother, who is an Indigenous dentist and software developer. And Dr. Lafontaine continues to practice anesthesia in Grand Prairie, although the door is always open for him in Saskatchewan. And he's lived there for about 10 years. Dr. Lafontaine has also assumed the role of president-elect for the Canadian Medical Association. And he is the first Indigenous and Pacific Islander ancestry in its 154 year history. So congratulations, Alika. Your talk, uh, Dr. Lafontaine's talk today is using social innovation as a tool of transformational change in medicine. Dr. Lafontaine. Thank you so much for that. And it's a pleasure to be back here virtually at the uh, U of S. I, I both trained and, and went to medical school at the U of S. And there's a lot of really, really good memories there. It was nice to hear Terry talk about uh, you know, the achievements of, you know, faculty that I grew to become friends with and, and trained under. And it's good to hear that the faculty is still doing very well, even after all these years. So as was mentioned, I'm going to be talking about uh, social innovation and creating transformational change. I, I think it's a, a topic that is relevant for physicians in general, because there's so many things that I think we all struggle with as far as trying to create change, especially in the environments where there's more and more challenges that are confronting us each and every day. So I'll just uh, mention a few things just as part of my disclosure. I did receive a recent grant from the Jewel Innovation Fund related to Safe Space Networks. I have had honorary in the past as chair of the CMAJ Governance Council, as well as other leadership positions over at the CMA and the AMA. And then I'm also the co-founder of Safe Space Networks, as was mentioned in my biography. The objectives for the discussion today were really centered around talking about what social innovation is and different models that we use. Um, this is a label that will probably uh, reflect some of your own lived experience in trying to create change within the health system. I'll go into a bit more detail about the role of things that are stressors, the role of bias, as well as the role of resistance in moving forward, you know, changes within systems. And along the way, we'll use some real world examples from my own experience, the Indigenous Health Alliance and Safe Space Networks to illustrate practical application. So hopefully at the end of all of this, you can either take the tools that you normally use in order to create change and use them with a, a bit more nuance and effectiveness, or you might have some tools that you might not have considered in the past introduced to you. So as was mentioned in my biography, I was born and raised there in Saskatchewan. I'm from the class of 2006. Uh, I've had the opportunity to serve in, in a lot of different leadership positions from organizations that have different perspectives on how to change healthcare. And along the way have been a part of leading, uh, you know, change within different areas and scopes. This picture is actually of me and my mom. It's at Regina General Hospital in Regina. This is the very first day I went to work that I was an actual doctor. 
So I had uh, graduated med school and this was uh, July 1st, the turnover day for new residents. And my mom being my mom brought me Subway for lunch and we sat down and, and had a good chat. And one of the things that she shared with me for the first time were kind of her hopes and fears related to medicine. So I think we all have different reasons for why we became doctors. And I know one of the big reasons for me was that my mom had always told all of us that she wanted someone within the healthcare system to turn to if she had problems. And on that day, my first day of residency, she started to unpack exactly what that meant. And she shared some experiences that she hadn't shared with me before about her own struggles to work her way through the healthcare system, her own fears and you know, her hopes about what could change. And I, I think that that really goes to what social innovation really is about. And so social innovation is uh, another way to talk about the process of navigating systems, peoples, and beliefs towards new ways of doing something. Usually at its core, it involves us looking at things differently, some sort of belief change. You know, over my residency in medical school, there are three really big changes that I think were really social innovations, you know, move towards patient safety, um, not just being safe, but being completely safe in areas that we could be completely safe. Uh, things around quality improvement. You know, we sometimes think that quality improvement has always been a part of medicine, when in reality, it's only really been around since the late 90s, early 2000s. And in a fairly short period of time from it being introduced, it was adopted across all health systems. Uh, or things like patient-centered care, which also was a concept that, you know, has been relatively new in the past couple of decades that started with a small group and then scaled out to include everything that we do. So all these things mean uh, reaching beyond usual stakeholders to mobilize different actions. You know, if you look at how the stakeholder groups within medicine have expanded, uh, early in medical school, we mainly focused on doctors, nurses, and then we called other people allied health care providers. We often didn't have the patient voice around the table. We often didn't turn to community organizations as far as being stakeholders within core system change. Um, but as we've expanded and included these groups that weren't there before, um, we've really moved towards what I think is the end outcome of social innovation, which is getting people to do things differently. And this often means redistributing resources to different people. And this could be new or old stakeholders. So things like people, money, information, influence, fiscal spaces, et cetera. So where can social innovation have impact? Um, I think there's a lot of contemporary issues that we're going through right now, things like physician burnout. You know, we exist within systems that are more or less under-resourced. We're often being asked to do more with less and less each day. There's changing societal expectations of what physicians actually do. Before physicians were within offices and kind of had a closed clinical relationship, we, uh, we weren't on social media like we were before, advocating like we are now with different social problems. And there's really issues that more and more we're, reali we're realizing directly impact our clinical practice. So things like climate change, the different isms, things like racism, sexism, ableism, classism, et cetera. You know, the UN came out with the sustainable development goals a few years ago. Every single one of these has an impact on our clinical pra practices. And so as we try and create better environments for our patients to achieve uh, more impactful outcomes, uh, how do we actually go about doing this in today, today's uh, social construct? So when I first got involved with social innovation, this is what I was taught it was. You know, you have a committee that's organized, that committee sits down and in its first few meetings comes up with some ideas about how to frame the change that you wanna move forward. You go out and you do a consultation. From the consultation, you write a draft report. You send that report out to the different people that you talk to about it. After they provide feedback and you make some changes, you then finalize it. You then publish your report along with a list of recommendations. And the majority of your work is trying to get people to adopt your recommendations. Now, I think years ago, this was impactful, but I would challenge most people to look back whether or not the reports that they published actually led to change. And I think what most of us find as we debrief and think about how change literally happened, we realize more and more that, you know, reporting and advocating for recommendations 
it's often not that that makes the big change. It's the relationships that you, you know, develop with other people. It's, you know, the stakeholder engagement. It's having frontline people share their stories, et cetera, that really mobilize social innovation. And so I'll, I'll give a couple examples as we kind of go through here. The first is the Indigenous Health Alliance. So I really took that model that I just presented and we use that as a way to start off the idea of transforming Indigenous health systems. Uh, over five years, we started with a small group of three communities. It eventually scaled to more than 150. At our peak, we had more than 24 national medical organizations who had signed on to either be a part of consultation or promote involvement within the Alliance. At the end of the Alliance in 2018, when we were winding down, we had raised 68 million for projects in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario. And a lot of the work that we do still influences the way that transformation occurs in many of these communities today. Uh, also, Safe Space Networks, uh, we opened a network in BC uh, earlier this year. Uh, it had sites across uh, BC that were friendship centers, so um, more than 20 sites that, that were there. And then we've, we're also in the course of uh, opening up sites within Ontario uh, at different clinics that uh, kind of cover the whole province and have plans to launch a national network uh, later on this year in early 2022. So along the way with these two projects and other projects that I've been involved in with the past, I, I actually learned that social innovation is this. So it's not really the process of organizing that committee work. What you're really doing is you're working through the process of people confronting, dissecting, uh, and acknowledging different ideas and new ways of doing things. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen this curve before, but this is called the Kubler-Ross change curve. It's taught in a lot of MBA courses. Um, your x-axis is time, and then your y-axis is people's either positive or negative feelings towards the step that you're in. And then your black line there is just whatever your baseline is. And so you start off with a neutral state. For some reason, there's uh, excitement that builds towards a change that is needed. So some sort of event occurs or some sort of strategy is, is uh, started where people start to think to themselves, okay, well, maybe we need to change what we're doing. And at that beginning, there's a feeling that, you know, this change could be exciting. This change could create a lot of difference. And as things progress, that initial excitement starts to scale down a little bit where people start to deny that the change actually needs to occur. All right, so although this event happened, you know, the status quo is actually working not too bad for us. Maybe we should rethink this. If you continue to push for the change, you move from this denial phase into this active resistance phase where now people have a very negative view of what's going on and uh, the change that was initially triggered. If you can make it through resistance, then you move towards exploration and then eventually commitment. So looking back on the projects that I've been involved in, uh, more specifically, each of these steps can be relabeled this way. So you start off with your status quo. Instead of the initial excitement, I put down sparks instead. Uh, these are literal, literal triggering events that spark some sort of change or some sort of fire in the people that uh, need the change within the system. As you move through, towards denial, what you're actually doing is articulating the knee-jerk myths and narratives that people believe. Um, these are often unconscious and just, like I said, knee-jerk reactions to pushing back to things that you're used to or familiar. As you move towards past these events, you then get into resistance, which is really a relationship between the way that people work day to day and the impacts on what they do literally over the intensity of whatever the spark is, so the intensity of whether or not the change needs to occur. And then you move towards the final two steps, which are exploration and commitment. So unpacking each one of these steps helps to understand that there's a pattern that happens within social innovation. And that if you understand this pattern and you articulate it within the area that you work or are trying to influence, you can actually create a strategy that is measurable, that you can create objective milestones for, and that you can really put people into to understand how to mobilize change around what you're doing. So uh, these pattern steps are identifying your stressor. You know, is this a one-off event uh, or is this a cycle? You know, what are the different characteristics around why the social change is happening? You articulate your biases and beliefs. You know, what is the universal narrative around why things stay the same the way that they do? 
Uh, the third is revealing resistance and then learning how to leverage that resistance. You know, how do you either mitigate people's workflow impacts day to day, or how do you amplify the stressors that are pushing forward and motivating people to change? And then finally, creating your team and kind of knowing your role in, in what's moving forward. So if you look at stressors specifically, and this is the context of uh, anti-racism, which I think everybody knows is, is, is a big area that people are pushing for change to happen. Uh, there's a variety of different things just within anti-racism that created uh, stressors. So there were fiscal pressures, social movements, stakeholder harm, shifts in evidence-based medicine, new legislation, new policy. If you look over to the left with each one of these, these pictures, uh, you have different seminal events. So there was the insight uh, in plain sight report that came out in BC a couple of summers ago. Uh, that was related to a drinking game that had been going on across emergency rooms within BC. So a patient would come in, they would have signs or symptoms of um, being uh, overdosing on alcohol. People would then guess what their blood alcohol level would be, and that would be the game, right? And so that led to a whole exploration across, you know, BC's uh, acute care departments in order to identify who's playing this, the, the whys and the impact on patient care. You know, the next picture is about Joyce Echequan. You guys might've heard about this in the news. She was a patient that live streamed her interactions with uh, persons within her care team as she was crying for help. Um, she was being responded to with what was obviously discriminatory and, and racist remarks. Shortly after she turned off the live stream, Joyce actually passed. That led to you know, huge meetings with the federal government and, you know, adopting anti-racism as part of their, their platform moving forward in health. Uh, Stop Asian Hate, which has had some links to, you know, COVID and, you know, false uh, attribution of, of harm that comes from Asian patients and discriminatory practices. And then Black Lives Matter, which uh, was really given new life through the death of George Floyd, uh, which crosses over not just health, but many other um, aspects of the societal experience of, of Black patients. So stressors are often part of a recurring cycle. And whenever you're looking at your stressor, I think sometimes we, we look at the stressor and then we kind of move on. I'd actually suggest that once you identify your stressor, you take a bit of time to dig into that stressor and learn a bit about the history of why that stressor exists. So in systems where these cycles continue, where these problems never get solved, where you kind of go through these cycles over and over again, where people are trying to create change, but not really finding the solutions. Um, you learn two things. The first is that there's often a narrative behind why things stay the same. The second is that with each subsequent cycle, uh, the resilience of the system actually gets worse. And so uh, a real time example of this is actually COVID and pandemic response. So with each subsequent wave, we've been confronted with similar problems. We've had more information, but as we cycle through and these problems continue, we're actually finding that the attitudes of people get worse, the ability of people to be resilient in the face of these challenges continues to weaken, and uh, eventually systems reach a point where they break. Understanding these cycles will help you articulate, you know, those biases and beliefs that you need in order to address your problem. So I'll give you an example from the Indigenous Health Alliance when we were looking at Indigenous health crises. So you'd have these crises going on within Indigenous communities across Canada, but eventually something would happen where those crises would suddenly take everybody's attention. And for a brief moment in time, all of society would be focused on problems within Indigenous communities. You know, within the time of uh, the Indigenous Health Alliance, we had, you know, the suicide crises across Northern Ontario and the suicide packs that are, were being uh, brought together by youth across the province. And, you know, this crisis took up so much attention and it eventually made its way into the New York Times and it was being discussed worldwide. And in response, decision makers called for a series of large meetings where, you know, senior advisors from across the country would kind of come together. And the purpose of that meeting was to have some sort of plan. And the implication was that if you implement the plan, the crisis would then be resolved. But obviously within Indigenous health, this problem hasn't been resolved. And so as we started to break down this common cycle, we started to ask ourselves, well, what else is going on other than this? So we actually found in talking with stakeholders and with communities that at the same time as this inner circle was happening, this inner narrative, there was also a series of steps that seemed to happen pretty reliably. Uh, 
on the sidelines. So when the crisis was called, decision makers would reach out to persons not within the community or group that was impacted and have what we ended up calling side conversations. And so these side conversations were really an opportunity for persons who held resources to talk to people who they believed had solutions. And these side conversations would happen between governments, you know, clinicians, uh, different clinician groups, uh, universities, academic groups, researchers, et cetera. And we found that from a lot of these side conversations, what would actually happen is in the course of the meeting and leading up into the plan, the government and other decision makers would actually already make decisions on where spending would go. So before you actually started any sort of community engagement, there was a part within the process where you'd spend the majority of your money before actually sitting down and asking people what they needed. And so as a result of these pre-allocation of resources, you ended up having this outside implementation. People who weren't necessarily involved in the crisis or understood the contexts of the communities that were involved uh, would be coming in and solving problems. And so as a result, when outside implementation occurred beyond a threshold, you know, beyond, you know, kind of this level of, of engagement and expertise, it would actually make the crises worse, you know, and you'd have less resources to actually deal with your problem. And we found that there was a lot of different areas that this could cycle through, not just within mental health, you know, but you could see other parts with relations to, you know, access to care, primary care, you know, there were there were issues with, you know, physical violence and opioid addiction that came out over the course of, of uh, the Alliance. And we were able to use the story to kind of articulate the narrative behind what was happening. And so having that helped us to understand our sparks and then how those sparks led to attitudes related to why things didn't change. And this takes us to the next point within the pattern, which is really bias and belief. So some of you may have seen this before. I see some familiar faces around here. Um, I'll have you walk through it one more time, but uh, would ask that you, you don't uh, spoil the fun for everyone else. But there's this concept out there that we're taught in medical school related to, you know, visual losses, you know, and uh, it's this word called scotoma. And so when I was learning about scotoma, uh, people, people taught us about this partial loss of vision or a blind spot in your otherwise normal visual field that you end up picking up because of some sort of neuromuscular disease, um, maybe had some sort of trauma, or maybe had some type of neurodegeneration, but for whatever reason, within your visual field, there was an area that you just couldn't see. And so I'll illustrate this here, and I'll just ask everybody just for a moment, just to turn on their cameras or to get into chat, uh, just to make sure you can participate here. Sometimes easier to do this in person, but I'm just gonna have you count the Fs in the following paragraph. And I'll then ask you how many you see. So don't actually go into chat to raise your hand about how many you see yet, but I'll have you count the Fs in the paragraph. I'll give you about three seconds and then we'll see how many Fs you actually count. So here's the paragraph here. I'm just gonna give you three seconds here. We'll give you one, we'll give you two, and we'll give you three. And I'm just gonna ask those who are present just to either type in the chat or to raise your hand how many, did you see three Fs? How many people saw three Fs? Just throw in your three there. Good. How many people saw four Fs? I see some fours going up. And then I see some people saw more than four. There's a variety of different numbers that are kind of going into chat right now. <laughs> All right. So let's count here and see how many there actually are. So finished files, all the result of years of scientific study combined with the experience of years. So one, two, three, four, five, six, all right? So there's some reasons why people don't see all the Fs within that paragraph. The first is that you read aloud. So when you're reading, often the sounds that you read don't line up with the sounds that you see in your head, right? So scientific sounds different than up. The second is that you read for content, even though you're asked to read. Right, so a lot of you, although I told you to count the Fs, we're still trying to figure out what exactly the paragraph was about. The third is that when we're given limited time, we're often told to skim in order to be efficient. And so big words equal content, small words equal to filler. So we often skip over kind of those small words. And so I'm just gonna ask you to read these triangles one more time and then I'll ask you another question. Uh, once again, there's no trick, just kind of read from left to right. 
So I'm gonna give you the triangles here and just read one triangle, two triangles, three triangles. There you go. And I'm gonna ask you to read them again. And I'd like you just to raise your hand on Zoom, whether or not you missed what was in there. I'm seeing some hands go down. All right. So what's interesting about this exercise is that even though I told you what the trick was, I told you how your mind would react to reading through those things. I gave you the reasons and the logic behind it. You didn't see what was there, right? Um, I remember sending in, you know, a presentation that had this uh, slide in there and, and I kept on sending it back saying, you know, you're, you're transcribing the slide wrong, but they actually couldn't see even at, after staring at the triangles over and over again that, that they were eliminating the extra, you know, word instead of uh, transcribing it correctly. And within each of us, we all have these distortions in perception. And I mean, all of us, you know, we all have these things in the way that we uh, respond to different, different sensory or cognitive inputs uh, that change the way that we interpret and understand things. And these have direct impacts sometimes on social interaction or institutional structure. And so the real take home message in all, all this is that bias and belief are part of who we are. Uh, it's not really something that we can eliminate, you know, and I think a lot of times we talk about eliminating bias, you know, eliminating these ideas that sometimes get expressed into things like racism or classism or sexism, etc. But the reality is, is that these beliefs will always come back and kind of creep out, even though we make efforts to eliminate them. What our goal is actually to do is to manage them. It's to recognize that a lot of these belief systems are maladaptive. They don't actually help us to understand how to solve the problems that we're trying to confront. And so when you push forward with social innovation, after you go through your process of identifying your stressor and then moving into the denial phase, this is once again, the knee-jerk pushback that's often intuitive and loosely organized, right? So if you ever tried to push forward some sort of change within your organization, the initial resistance that people push back is usually rooted in beliefs or bias that they have that work against the change that you're trying to push forward. So if you wanna show some examples from, you know, the, the Alliance and the work that we did, it'll be things related to, you know, this is just the way that things are. It will take generations to fix these problems. You know, the, the reason why these problems exist are because the individual doesn't care about themselves or the community. You know, until we change that, we can't change anything else. Uh, the community or the person's not ready for change, they have no capacity, you know, a, a continued uh, circling back to old solutions that haven't been effective in the past, but maybe they will be this time around. Um, labeling things as some sort of inheritance, whether it's genetic, cultural, organizational, etc., as well as many, many others. And I see a few nodding heads. And so, you know, no matter what the changes that we bring forward, um, Things like this are, are not uncommon as people kind of manifest their bias and their internal beliefs. And so if you can get past this part, if you can get through the narratives that push back against your change, you then get into this phase where people are actively resisting. And that's really di the difference between denial and resistance within the Kubler's change curve is once you get to resistance, people actively coordinate, deliberately coordinate to push back against your change. And there's, there's a really good reason why this happens. So if you break down resistance into a fraction and you look at kind of the top part, your numerator, you can think through that when people have changes occur, it changes the way that they work, the way that they live day to day, the way that they either receive resources, distribute resources, you know, their accountabilities, their responsibilities, et cetera. And so if you have increased work, increased cost to, you know, your silo, your part of the budget, if you're suddenly asked to make decisions on data that you might not be used to making decisions around, if you have changes in who you report to, changes in accountability, changes in responsibility, et cetera, those are all not necessarily unreasonable things to be concerned about, you know? And so understanding those workflow changes is something that we don't always do when we try and push forward broad social innovation and change. And it is important in working through those literal impacts on people's lives 
as you try and figure out a path to, to move things forward. Uh, on the bottom of that fraction, as you try and figure out uh, your relative resistance, is the intensity of the stressor. And I'll use an example of my own work in Alberta. You know, people brought in Connect Care, um, our electronic medical record system. So there was a lot of uh, intense uh, reasons why shifting over to an EMR provincially was a really good idea. One of the ways that they increased the intensity of the stressor to overcome very significant workflow changes. I mean, my paperwork time has increased probably 100, 125% relative to the amount of paperwork that I did before. And I always thought that I left really good patient notes and, and charts within my own anesthetic practice. Um, in order to overcome that, what actually happened is they removed all paper within the hospital. So if the computer goes down, there's literally no way for us to record anything. We have to take a clear piece of paper and like write down boxes and labels and things. And you know what, that actually was a really good incentive to uh, move over clinical practice to, you know, the, the EMR. You literally had no other choice uh, except to do it that way. And so when you look at resistance, if you're just looking at it objectively of how to move past it, uh, your goal is to get your resistance below one. So if your workflow impacts are greater than the intensity of your stressor, uh, your resistance ends up being greater to one, greater than one, and you'll have a relatively more difficult time or impossible time moving forward your change. So your choices in moving past resistance are either to mitigate workflow impacts or to increase the intensity of whatever the stressor is to overcome those workflow impacts. You know, which actually runs contrary to a lot of th things that we often learn within social innovation using older models. Uh, we're often told that, well, you know, your, your stressor is really intense, but let's meet to de-escalate the situation. Let's quit bringing in new stakeholders, which add additional pressure. You know, let's stop speaking openly about the realities of what's happening day to day. You know, what that actually does is it decreases the intensity of your denominator, that lower number, and increases the resistance within the system. You know, ignoring the workflow impacts of people going through change, you know, saying, you know, people just need time to, to get involved instead of understanding why they're actively resisting it, actually increases the workflow impacts. It doesn't mitigate them. And so then increases your resistance and makes it harder to move forward uh, the change that you're trying to implement. And so if, once again, we bring this all back together and we review the steps, you know, we start off with the status quo, we understand our sparks, we articulate the narratives behind the change that we're trying to create, often understanding historical aspects and the deeper biases and beliefs that people turn to as a knee-jerk reaction uh, to the change that's trying to, to push forward. If you get past that point towards resistance and you acknowledge and take steps to mitigate your workflow and changes. And if you always remember that when it comes to your sparks, your goal is not to deescalate them. Your goal is actually to amp them up or maintain them relative to the workflow changes that need to occur. You can start to see how moving through these different things can create a, a different path towards system change. Now, if you apply this to the Safe Space Networks experience that we went through, we, we literally applied this as we went through uh, rolling out the network across BC and now into Ontario. You know, our sparks included the BC in plain sight report when Joyce Echaquan uh, ended up dying in, in that Quebec hospital. You know, it created an anecdotal experience that a lot of Indigenous patients could really link to um, and understand. Uh, there were organized patient protests that happened across BC. As we started to unpack and moved into the denial phase, we articulated that a lot of the beliefs that underlied the denial were that there were low reports of racism. And the assumption was if people don't report it, it can't happen. We all know that there's other reasons why people don't report. Um, if there was a problem that was this bad, you know, patients would be more bold. The idea that the person who's experiencing the harm needs to shoulder the change as they move forward, as they move forward system change. Uh, bad experiences are due to patient factors, kind of links back to that, that bias and belief that, uh, you know, it's, it's the person who's experiencing it that created the problem instead of having the system or the persons who provide the care kind of taking on uh, their kind of share of, of the problem. As we moved into resistance, we realized that within the existing workflow, uh, there was extremely high system risk and even acknowledging this. 
So if you never acknowledged racism in the past, acknowledging it now was adding and layering a new type of risk onto the system. And, this, and systems are not designed to increase the amount of risk that they take on. They're designed to decrease the amount of risk that they take on. Uh, we realized that the investigative resources that were out there right now were uh, under-resourced just to begin with. And so now creating additional things that they had to investigate led to huge changes in workflow to the point that it became overwhelming. Um, we also realized that there, there was a lot of training that needed to occur. So people even understood how to see the red flags of racialized experiences. Things like uh, the first time that a patient reports a racialized incident is extremely unlikely to be the first time. There's often serial events that happen and then it gets to the point where they feel like they have to report. And uh, you know other, other types of red flags that we identified there. And so moving on to kind of the fourth thing, which is knowing your role. Uh, in all of the system change, uh, there's different parts that need to be played. And we often underestimate the importance of building and leaning on other parts of the team. It's very hard to be both the agitator and the visionary at the same time. You know, you, you can't have someone aggravate the system, then turn around and say, you know, I'd like to convene and be a trusted collaborator. Um, we also need people who do other roles, things like power mapping, persons who understand rules within the systems, persons who understand how to navigate narratives and myth bust. Sometimes there's the role for people who actually create propaganda. You know, there's the roles for people who resist people who support change, you know, first followers and first adopters, first and secondary influencers, collaborators, conveners, um, as well as decision makers, truth validators, et cetera. But the important part is to know that within that Kubler-Ross change curve and within your different phases of status quo, sparks, working through bias and narrative and then confronting resistance, is that there's a variety of different people that you have to gather who provide different input and different insight at different stages along that path. So kind of some final thoughts and summaries related to this. Uh, this template won't work for everything, but it has been pretty effective in my own social innovation efforts. Uh, your work will both be qualitative and quantitative, which also means that it'll be both logistical and somewhat theatric. You know, you can't just have your plan, you also have to understand your people. And understanding the people within systems requires you to create moments and motivation for people to feel like they're a part of something to get excited about change. Um, the different parts of the Kubler-Ross change curve that I went through in more detail, just a reminder that narratives bring everything together and then that final part of kind of knowing your role. So I'd be happy to open it up to questions and thanks again for me inviting me to be a part of this today. Thank you very much, Alika. Uh, that was a fantastic talk and I'm, I'm so happy that you agreed to participate as a speaker today. I know I had to do uh, you know, maybe some, some arm twisting, but you are definitely a committed uh, alumni and we so much appreciate it. Uh, Karen Shaw is going to moderate a question and answer session. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat um, or email them to us, but preferably the chat and um, and uh, Karen will ask them of Alika. Karen. Thank you very much, Alika. Uh, again, a wonderful presentation, very thought provoking. Um, and uh, I guess I struggle as a, a person who works in our healthcare system uh, in, an, in the regulatory uh, area, as you're aware. I mean, you have been very gracious and generous with your time to try and educate uh, our counselors at the College of Physicians and Surgeons and, and us as staff. I guess as I work through this, and one of the challenges I, we have is to identify our inherent biases uh, in our processes. And so we have committed to looking at um, our lack of education or our lack of knowledge on anti-Indigenous racism. Uh, both at the staff and at the uh, governance level, but then also because of the work we do on behalf of the public, we will need to uh, do some of this work with physicians and try and assist physicians um, to understand a little bit more. And I guess I struggle with where do we start in terms of um, 
who needs to be at the table? If I'm going to assist physicians in understanding their inherent biases and also understanding how um, their lack of knowledge or understanding of Indigenous ways is harming um, the Indigenous people's efforts to have good health, who do I need at the table and how do I proceed? Yeah, so that's obviously a really big question. <laughs> and uh, I, I, think, I think it's the right questions. So number one, um, I think the, the very first thing that I'll say is that we often, we often take the position, especially in, in a contemporary sense, that with a lot of these problems, um, maybe we shouldn't be the ones solving them, right? Um, there's a level of discomfort for say, like a, a man to address a gender inequity and sexism, right? Or a non-racialized person to deal with racialized uh, experiences. And that's not wholly wrong, but part of the process is really claiming our power in position for decision-making, right? So there are titles which exist within regulatory structures that just are what they are. They're the people who make those decisions, right? And so you have to be a part of unpacking. And I think understanding that there is an important role and honestly a role that you can't shift to other groups in the course of unpacking these things, things is a really important place to start, right? So uh, there is that saying, you know, nothing for us without us. And I think when it initially came out and it was being talked about, it was this idea that, you know, we need to be brought to the table and we shouldn't be ignored and we shouldn't be excluded, right? And I don't think that just applies to Indigenous health, but also, you know, when physicians run into problems with, you know, changes that are happening within the health care system, you know, COVID has endless examples of this being uh, there. You can't just make a decision that impacts my practice without having me at the table or someone who's going to engage me and understand my perspective, right? And so starting from there, the next question is what parts of the system are actually causing problems for those stakeholders who might not be at the table? So the place that I always encourage uh, organized um, or structured uh, hierarchical organizations is if you're taking something like complaints, right? what is the status quo of how these complaints work their way through the system? So literally, you know, an experience of racism comes forward to, you know, a regulatory body. Um, who decides when that gets escalated? What are their decision-making processes? How do they validate that those decision-making processes are valid? Who evaluates risk at whom? Uh, what are kind of the informal ways that people move back and forth when it comes to kind of labeling different things? Because we we know that there's a lot of steps that we don't necessarily articulate between the time that someone submits something formally or informally, and then it gets launched into a structured uh, type of process that once it start, starts to go, we actually can't change, right? So we kind of have that area of flexibility, and then we get into that area where it becomes a more transparent, straightforward process. So unpacking all that detail um, is really important. And then stepping back and asking, well, who can answer maybe... The, uh, the parts that we don't understand the experience. So, you know, when I come, say, as a, if you're just looking at me as a provider, you know, there are certain things that I, as a provider, think during my experience of submitting a complaint that maybe don't get articulated uh, within the way that things work day to day. So one example would be, you know, I don't want to quote unquote cattle on my colleague, even though I know they're not practicing effectively. So break that down. Why does that matter? You know, why do I act that way? You know, one part is that it's, you can't actually submit a complaint without putting your name on it, right? And so I may have to work with that colleague every day. I may even be part of the same call schedule. So that colleague gets upset with me. Suddenly I can't do call switches. Suddenly when I'm on call, they're looking for things that they can pick apart as far as my clinical practice. You know, you look from a patient point of view, their relationship with that clinician, they have to put their name on it. Now something that changes the character of their care, if they're the only person that they can receive care from, from the area that they're in, they could find, they could effectively like not have access to care anymore. You know, you get thrown into your chart that you're a difficult patient now and forevermore, you have to, you know, unpack for people that you come to for care that maybe you're not that difficult patient. Maybe there's, you know, other reasons why that happened. And so there's a lot of emotional, you know, weight and, and work that goes into that. Right. And so understanding your status quo, fully articulating that, 
and then moving to the point where you start to describe your narrative, uh, I always start with the idea that things that people do make sense and ask the question of why does this make sense to you, even though it's clearly not fixing your problem, it's making it worse. Right? And as you go through that process, I think you start to understand more and more the, the different people that you need, need to bring into uh, to understand those things. And, and you'll gain different insights. I mean, we didn't think at the very beginning of unpacking that that crisis meeting plan implement circle that side conversations would be the first thing that we found. You know, that, that obviously wasn't even on our radar. We knew that these conversations occurred. Um, and if you look at our own clinical practice as an analogy, when I'm preparing someone for the OR, like I honestly have many, many side conversations with every patient. You know, I phone the cardiologist, they help me to understand the echo or some of their specific concerns. I talk with the surgeon about different like approaches. What's the likelihood of them going open versus laparoscopic? I mean, there's all these different layers, right? But the problem there becomes an issue when I don't circle back to the patient and let them know the things that they should know as they make their own informed decision about how to move forward, right? And so those different aspects of your narrative will get unpacked as you ask about your status quo, you figure out why people believe what they believe and you just treat it as logical, even though it may be maladaptive. And then you start to expand, well, what's, what's underneath the story? What's underneath the informal way that we decide whether or not a complaint moves forward? And, and that's the place that I'd start. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? Um, because I'm going to ask Alika another really tough one, if uh, no one else has one. There's there's a nice uh, comment from uh, Dr. McCall. Thanks very much, Dr. McCall. I'm sure Alika will read that later. Alika, one of the struggles in, and I mean, I really like your, your process here uh, as to work through things. And we have been trying to engage appropriate people in identifying an engagement strategy to get the right people at the table to try and and uh, change our system so that it is, um, I mean, I guess more welcoming or more uh, more safe for the individuals as they as they come forward with their concerns. But uh, I recently went through an anti-Indigenous education session and we were looking at some of the cases within the In Plain Sight report. And although they were examples of uh, potential um, uh, concerns with racist behavior, one of the things I struggled with in some of the cases was, well, there wasn't enough information to really know. So uh, my default is, well, if the patient thinks it's racist behavior, that's what we have to take it at at face value. However, the more I looked at some of the question or, or some of the context, it was really bad medical care. <laughs> and so how do I tease out really bad medical care um, from... I mean, from the patient's perspective, they felt they were treated differently because uh, they were uh, Indigenous patients. Yet, when I looked at it with my sort of regulator hat on, I thought, okay, that's, that's certainly possible and that's their perception. So we have to pay attention to it. But I'm looking at really bad care here. This shouldn't have happened to any patient. So how do you tease that out? Because I know sometimes people will come to us and they'll say, you know, we've placed a complaint and, and you, uh, you're you just covering the butts of the docks because you didn't come to where I was. And I guess I'm, I was even hesitant to even say that to the group. This was really bad medical care number one. There may have been a racist behavior as well. I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't have enough information. But how do I tease those things out? And so you, you, you hit on a nuance of investigating any sort of patient harm, uh, where there's negative experiences that are just um, a part of like clinical care. And then there's negative experiences that are either, you know, uh, deviations from standards of care or expressions of things like racism, classism, sexism, et cetera. All right. And so it is true that all of those experiences are negative but not all negative experiences reach the threshold of like being, um, like violating standards of practice, et cetera. Um, and I, I think that sometimes when we discuss these issues, we don't make that differentiation. Um, no, it, it, is, it is important that if someone perceives harm, like we acknowledge that that's harm, 
Um, but whether or not that harm reaches the threshold of being objectively um, objectively malpractice or you know racist or sexist or whatever, uh, that that's actually a different question, you know. And so there, there's this one slide that I present in you know one of my other uh, leadership uh, trainings where we we look at the differences between bias, discrimination, theisms, racism, and colonialism. Right. And so biases we discussed are like these distortions that we all have. Discrimination is when we project those distortions onto other people uh, based on, you know, their gender, their age, like all the different reasons why we have bias. It's an ism when you link that projected bias with a threatened loss or real loss of opportunity. So an ism actually involves either taking something away or not giving something to someone that they'd otherwise have. Racism is, you know, when that's specifically due to the way that someone looks or talks or, you know, their, their cultural background. And then colonialism is just, you know, the, the uh, organized structure to use that as a way of taking away land, rights to lands and resources, right? And so one of the reasons why I go back to this slide when teaching about this concept is that we, we sometimes lose the nuance and the narrative that there's like these graduations and then there has to be some measurement of the actual harm, you know? Um, things that can be perceived as racism, like, you know, waiting in a merge or other things, waiting in a merge for, you know, a cut on your finger that's not infected uh, and doesn't have a likelihood of being infected in, in a short period of time is not the same as being in a merge with crushing chest pain and diaphoresis, right? But there's not a lot of teaching to patients or even to clinicians about how to tease out those two different situations, you know? And so my advice around that is that that's just something that we have to build up towards. I mean, we, we see more and more with QI frames that they, they look at, you know, some arbitrary, and it really is an arbitrary measurement of like harm, quote unquote, you know? And I've seen some that you have rating systems where the highest rating is death and the lowest rating is just a bad experience that didn't have any clinical impact. That kind of type of thinking needs to be introduced into uh, the approaches to some of these things and actually asking people like, how would you actually measure your harm, but then giving them relative, you know, ratings, right? Because if, if the only negative experience that someone has experienced is, you know, waiting too long in eMERGE because we just don't have enough resources, they don't necessarily understand that relative context. And so when you're building out these narratives and you're understanding like your bias and, you know, like your different components of resistance, um, you can actually just literally ask your stakeholders, you know, uh, where does this fit on kind of relative harm? You know, where does this fit on the continuum of like the very worst thing that you could ever imagine happening? And, you know, something that obviously was a bad experience, but we can all 100% agree that this should not impact like someone's privileging or their ability to practice within their normal scope. So ho hopefully that that's that's helpful. Yes, that's that's very helpful. Thanks, Alika. Uh, anyone have any uh, additional questions? I I'm afraid I've been uh, using this <laughs> opportunity to uh, improve our uh, efforts at the college. Well, if no one has any additional questions, I, I want to thank you again, Alika, for a very good presentation. Um, you always leave me with a few more pearls as to try and figure out whether I've considered everything as I move forward in our, uh, our journey to try and uh, provide what we can to support uh, anti-Indigenous uh, racism, but also to support uh, the well-being and the needs of our uh, Indigenous people and of all, all people in Saskatchewan. So thank you once again. All right, thanks for having me.